Our last speaker is, and by no means least, is Michael Marsh, who's our medical director for the Trust. He's a paediatric um, uh, clinician uh, by, by profession, and uh, Michael's going to wind up the conference for us. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank you very much, Mel. Um, I am now the only thing between you and uh, lunch uh, and an opportunity to talk and uh, engage, so I will keep um, it very brief. Um, I'm not going to show you a single slide um, and I'm not going to talk at you and I'm not going to show a video either, um, so uh, I'm ahead of all the others. Uh, put simply, uh, when I think about innovation, I think that there are two broad categories of innovation and I think you've heard examples of them this morning and certainly work in hospital, they're both important to us. But in, in your roles, it may be one or the other rather than both. There is the new discovery, and that's what you would imagine the university and academic researchers are going to be uh, involved in. And very often it leads to paradigm shifts, a big change in how we do something because we have a fundamentally different understanding of what we're dealing with. And more often it's about new ways, and those are often small things, however their effect is often profound and in a way that is far greater than the scientific change because when we uh, discover something new in terms of science there often is uh, 10, 20 years of greater understanding that's required in order to enable you to actually uh, affect a change whereas the smaller innovations of new ways usually allow you to do things immediately and affect lives that you can see rather than after you've finished uh, your working life. And it's absolutely not just faster horses. Um, it's different things. Um, people that know me know that I love history, and I love ancient history particularly. And uh, um, I was, somebody said to me this morning, so who's it going to be? You know, which Roman emperor? Well, it's not. We're going to go back a bit further. Um, about two and a half thousand years ago, a little bit more than that, uh, within Greece, there was a profound innovation uh, that... In terms of man, for a long time, there has been stories, there's been, in, uh, there's been the narrative description of what goes on. And if you read any ancient history, folklore, stories, um, and some of the best stories that we have now come from those origins. However, in, in what we now think of as Greece, about 2,600 years ago, they did something that was very profound, which was they innovated from telling a story so instead of saying the, tink, the king took his sword and stabbed somebody, they developed acting and performing. And they took a sword and they had somebody pretending to do it and did it. Now, people don't think about that, but actually that's an absolutely profound change. And the world that we live in, the Western Christian democracy, really has its origins from that. Because in terms of changing from storytelling to acting, simple change, it led to the development of democracy because it enabled people to question what others were doing in a way that was never really thought of before. And in that time, there was absolute power and control, but the start of democracy came from the fact that people could pretend they were a king, could be a god uh, in a play. So I absolutely want to stress the importance of the doing things differently because I think they are the most important innovations that are going to affect healthcare in, in our lifetime. One of the things hopefully you've seen from this morning is that as an organisation we're full of people who have a restless energy to try and improve things. It's exactly the same reason that I work in a teaching hospital. I'm a paediatric intensivist, I look after critically ill children. The whole drive of my life for the last 20 years is to try and stop children uh, dying. Most of medicine is about helping people through crises, but there are opportunities. There are few where you can make a real difference and absolutely save lives. But all of us that are in healthcare, in this sort of environment, are desperately trying to find out how do we do the next thing? How do we improve uh, this? How do we make a, a marginal gain here, there? In the past, the NHS, the word commercial has been a dirty word, um, and Mel and I have these conversations. It's still a dirty word to some people. It's absolutely not a dirty word to the government. It's not a dirty word to the greater organisation, and it shouldn't be a dirty word to any of us. And I think commercial activity and commercial opportunities absolutely provide us some of the great opportunities to improve our healthcare. Um, there are huge opportunities for um, spin-out companies. Um, 
there are also huge opportunities for SMEs to uh, go from an SME to becoming a world leading uh, FTSE 100 company uh, if you spot the opportunity and you do the right things early. Look at the great successes around IT. It's not been the clever stuff, it's been the simple stuff. Who would have thought putting utter drivel about yourself onto the worldwide net with a few stupid pictures would create what it has created? I personally still don't get it. I signed up to Facebook about two months ago and I've still got three friends and I don't know anything to say <laughs> and I haven't posted a single thing because everything I can think of doesn't seem profound. And also, I don't understand any of the words that my children put on it when they're put, you know, in, in relation to their pictures. Um, one of the other things that's happened that I think is really important is um, the government has done something that's really important. It has tried to create alignment. And alignment is something that is a necessary ingredient, ingredient to usually bring uh, significant change. They've talked about the Wessex uh, region here. There has been alignment of the academic health science networks as described, and just at the same time, uh, not talked about particularly, there has been uh, alignment of our clinical research networks. That's no accident, that is absolutely intentional. It also fits with the clinical alignments that we already have. The hospitals and the health economies that work in that area Whatever the health reorganisations for the last 20 years, we've carried on working in those groups. And the government has tried to do something which I hope will uh, set us up for the next 20 or, or 50 years in terms of having better health care that um, creates, fosters and encourages innovation. My final two points would be, I think you can see from this morning, there are many opportunities for engagement and there are many opportunities for innovation. And I think Tim's uh, little talk and video um, illustrates that very nicely. His, his operation showed you that there, were some, there was lots of innovation there. There was lots of technology. There were lots of new toys um, that keep some of us happy. But there was also some superb innovations there that were as simple as taking a bit of exercise. They were as simple as creating a score system, the Nun score. Now, when he was talking about the Nun score, it, it reminded me of one of my favourite other historical programmes, Blackadder, uh, when Baldrick's asked by uh, Captain Blackadder, what occupation is your mother? And, and he says, none. And he says, don't be stupid, you can't be a nun. He goes, oh, yes, on the form, when it said occupation, they wrote none. <laughs> anyway, I think humour is important too, if you haven't uh, <laughs> gathered that. So innovation can be as simple as observation. And that's what that is all about, it's just observing things uh, and looking at little things that potentially give you opportunities to uh, make a significant, a real uh, change. So on that note, I will stop. Okay, thank you very much.